Hello, good afternoon everyone. This is Catherine Bayer at River Network and thank you so much for joining our webinar today about celebrating the Wild and Scenic River's 50th anniversary. This is the first of what we hope will be several webinars in collaboration with the Wild and Scenic uh, River's 50th celebration team. So thanks for joining us. Um, we're gonna give it a minute more to let people keep joining us, but in general, uh, you should be able to hear us, but we can't hear you. Questions will be through the chat box. So um, hang tight for another minute and we will get started in just one or two minutes. Okay, perfect. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So again, this is Catherine Baer. I'm Director of Science and Policy here at River Network. And thanks everyone for joining us today on our webinar celebrating Wild and Scenic Rivers 50th, the Spark Community Engagement. We've got a really great lineup today um, of speakers I think you're really going to enjoy hearing from with great experiences from around the country about what they're doing in their communities with their Wild and Scenic Rivers. So we're really excited um, to be partnering uh, with Lisa Ronald and the Wild and Scenic Rivers 50th anniversary um, team who is gearing up this year as we come to this great anniversary of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. So um, as we're getting started, just a few logistics. Um, you should be using your computer speakers for audio or um, and then please use the chat box for questions. We will be watching the questions as they come in during the webinar and we will be taking if there are um, clarification questions you need to ask, then we will stop the speakers and ask them. Otherwise, we will be holding the questions till the end of the webinar. And finally, we will be, you'll see a, um, a survey at the end and in the follow-up email. We would so appreciate it if you would take um, the very short few minutes to fill out the post-webinar survey so we can keep improving on these webinars that we're providing to our community. So thanks very much and um, appreciate you taking the time to do that. So just quickly, a little bit about River Network. For those of you who are not familiar with us, um, we are an organization and for 29 years, um, River Network has filled a unique niche in the environmental community by focusing primarily on the 2000 plus river and watershed organizations that work at the local and state levels. But we also strive to really engage a much broader community to support healthy rivers and water resources throughout the country. And today our focus is structured around strategic areas that ha are really important for healthy rivers, aligning our expertise and community engagement efforts to the greatest impact, including in the areas of clean and ample water and strong and effective organizations. Um, and we provide our community and really anyone interested and have with a curiosity in this area, access to proven best practices related to river protection and restoration through our website, webinars like these, our annual conference river rally, publications, access to a network of experts and resources, all of which to help individuals, groups, and coalitions become more effective champions for our waters. Our team includes a dedicated set of people who really understand the challenges of those working on the ground and how to take care of their waters, and the importance of science to making sound decisions, as well as how to use policy and advocacy to create lasting change. So as a um, nonprofit, we are a membership-based organization. Uh, we'd love to have you join as a member, and for those of you who are members, we really appreciate it. We have a num number of different levels, and you can see the sort of uh, benefits you get at different levels in terms of um, access to different services we have and discounts on consultation. I would say right now, we've got our annual River Rally coming up um, at the end of April, and as I mentioned, this is our annual meeting, a really exciting conference for those of you who've been. This year will be uh, will be in Lake Tahoe, California, April 29th to May 2nd. As a member, as a dues paying member, you will get a 25% discount on registration, which is open. And especially important for this group today, as part of the uh, River Rally this year, the first day we're going to have a special meeting about wild and scenic rivers and what groups are doing and the potential of working together more closely in a sort of a coalition. So we hope you'll join us at Rally and at the Wild and Scenic Rivers pre-meeting um, in April. So 
for now, that's it for me. I am going to hand it over to Lisa Ronald, who is the Wild and Scenic River's 50th anniversary uh, coordinator, to talk more about that as well to introduce our speakers today. So thank you, Lisa. Thanks, folks. Um, hopefully you can all see my screen. And before we get started here, I just want to um, give a couple of brief reminders and introduce who may not be familiar with them. Uh, we've designed a series to help you learn from and get inspired from your peers when it comes to event planning, community building, and partnership development for the Wild and Scenic River's 50th anniversary. The series will feature a variety of tips, lessons learned, and stories shared by nonprofit organizations and agency partners alike. Um, so I, I would encourage you to mark your calendars for our second and third webinars. Um, the, the second webinar will be in late March or early April. Um, we'll be having some more information forthcoming on the exact date of that. Um, that webinar will feature some plug and play options as well as more stories like those you will hear today. Uh, and our third webinar in the series is scheduled for June 4th, where we will focus on working with outstanding outfitters and engaging students and diverse populations, again, through stories uh, shared to illustrate some of our best practices. Um, a couple of reminders. Um, our toolkit that you see online is where you will find a breadth of planning and partnership resources. I encourage you to check that out. That is your go-to place for uh, all things wild and scenic related. Similarly, we have a map that uh, shows and showcases a variety of river events that are taking place across the country. When you work with your partners and you create uh, events and community building activities in your community, please uh, log on to this map, which you can get access to in the toolkit that I just showed. Uh, if you click on the add your event to this map, big blue button, um, and key in basic information about your event, you'll put a push pin on the map for your unique event. And then finally, the Rivers Anniversary and the National Trails Act 50th Anniversary share the same birthday. So not surprisingly, there's a parallel trail 50th effort um, going on in uh, lockstep with what we are doing for rivers. Uh, similarly, on trails50.org, you'll find a toolkit for the trails anniversary as well as information about um, the trail, uh, a trail event map um, that features events, trail related events for the anniversary. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce our first presenter. So we have Rika Ayat, uh, who is the executive director for Discover Your Forest, which is a friends organization for the Deschutes and uh, Oshoto National Forest and Crooked River National Grassland in Central Oregon. Her Background is in museum studies and nonprofit business management. In her three years with Discover the Forest, she has annually leveraged $2 million in funds and labor benefiting public lands through unique and creative ventures, several of which she's going to share with us today. So thank you, Rika, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, my audio has been a little strange over here, so please feel free to let me know if it's not coming through clearly. Um, so uh, as we just mentioned, uh, my name is Rika Ayat. I'm the executive director for Discover Your Forest. Our organization is the friends group for the Deschutes and Ochoco National Forest here in Central Oregon. And as somebody who's worked in nonprofits for a long time, I think many of us uh, know that we as nonprofits love a 50th anniversary. Um, or really a 25th anniversary, a 60th anniversary. Um, we love celebrating those milestones and it's a great way to engage the community in you know, an exciting moment. I will. Oh, 
people can probably feel this way too, can also be a real challenge because that you in addition to what you're doing every other year that you're not having an anniversary. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about today, sort of how we're tackling, uh, making sure that we are celebrating this important milestone and making it a big moment, um, but at the same time, not overwhelming ourselves and jeopardizing um, all the work that we need to continue doing this year. So um, let's see if I can change slides here. There we go. Uh, in Central Oregon, um, we have eight different waterways designated um, as wild and scenic in various um, sections of those waterways. Uh, they are um, on three separate public land sites. So the Deschutes National Forest, the Ochoco National Forest, um, and the BLM. So we've got three land managers, uh, eight waterways. a huge diversity of um, like rivers here and uh, also you know Bend is just a, an area and Central Oregon in general people here are passionate about rivers recreation is really important to our community and the rivers play a big part in that so um, first and foremost just sort of the way that our community thinks about rivers we really felt like we had to um, make sure we gave this anniversary the and fair that um, it was due here in our community so um, here's what we did is uh, back in 2016, um, I had only been in my job for about a year, two or three people stopped by my desk to remind me that in two years, it would be the 50th anniversary of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. And so I dutifully noted it on my calendar. And um, in 2017, um, we started really sort of And your audio is and, going uh, in and out. Of our local Newberry National. Is it okay? Yeah, um, I wonder if I might um, switch to my phone really quick. Would everybody? Sorry. Let's see. If everybody can just hang tight. I can't seem to get the phone call. Um, so, if, hold on. Okay, just, let's just keep going with this. Just, yeah, I'll just let you know if it goes up or down. Okay, feel free to stop me again um, if we need to just let it refresh. So, we, um, in 2017, we started really trying to nail down what exactly we were wanted to do. Um, and also how we were going to fund the things that we wanted to do. So we started to look at some potential funding sources. Uh, our regional office um, in Portland, the Forest Service Regional Office, was able to provide a little bit of funding for us to do some programming. Um, and also we applied to the National Environmental Education Foundation for some funding. We didn't end up getting that funding, but I will say the process of seeking funding what we wanted to do um, and gave us some parameters. Once that was done, we had some initial brainstorming ideas in place, some programs we wanted to do, some stewardship days. And because we're in Central Oregon, of course, we had to um, involve our local breweries um, and started working with some of our contacts in the brewing world to ask them whether or not they would consider naming beers for this anniversary and helping us to raise local awareness. And so through this planning process, we realized that we were only going to really be able to do about three or four things on our own and that in the grand scheme of things that was going to be a pretty small showing and so what we decided to embark on was a convening effort where we reached out to all of the organizations we work with in central oregon that focus on rivers or have a connection to rivers and
um, which was the next. So what we heard from our partners, um, a lot of them were in the same position we were that, you know, they had kind of started planning some things, but it didn't feel super substantial or they had heard about it, but didn't feel like they had the capacity to, to do anything that was sort of noticeable or big enough. Um, and also, you know, folks who said, well, we do this every year, but uh, this event every year, but this would be a great year to give it some extra attention and to change up the theme of it so that it had a wild and scenic rivers focus. So um, we ended up with a total of nine partners and we heard these same things from all those partners. And what we realized is, is that if we teamed up and each of us brought the two or three programs or three or four programs we were planning to offer or were able to do, then Thirty-five programs scheduled for the year to all of us. So that was an exciting moment, um, and there have been since then a ton of benefits that we've realized from convening. So obviously, our program calendar is more robust. Our original plan was three to four events. Um, we're looking at over thirty now with our group effort. Um, we're tapping into shared fundraising and marketing networks. So on our efforts to get breweries uh, to name beers in honor of the anniversary. I had my own brewery contacts and um, you know, got three or four breweries to sign on. But once we engaged our partners, um, we've grown that number to seven. And it looks like by the end of the month, we'll have grown it to 10. And that's really just leveraging. You know, All of us have different contacts. All of us have different partnerships. And so that's really just leveraging those. Um, and it's happened in lots of other ways, too. Um, Uh, similar or duplicate programs. I think some of us were both kids program or a family day. Now we're planning one big family event where all the partners are going to be working on programs and activities for kids so that we're not doing um, more than one. Uh, there's some other examples of that too. Speakers that one of us had planned to have not knowing the other one had already planned it. So that was really nice just to eliminate that duplication. Um, we established some new working relationships uh, that um, some of us had not worked together before and uh, we've you know gotten just a better working relationship going we know more about the work that we're all doing and then of course you know the end goal which is that we're just providing better service to the public so the people of Central Oregon are getting a really well-rounded and robust program schedule to celebrate these extremely important to the community. So those are the benefits. Eight people does not come without its challenges. Um, and we have faced some of those. I think um, I think we can all remember, you know, when you work on a group project in college and there's that there's those one or two people in your group who uh, just aren't returning your emails. Um, people get busy and uh, try to keep this I know on top of their radar, but that can be a real challenge. I think that's one of the things we've struggled with the most is varying levels of engagement from our partners at different times and just trying to keep everybody's um, engagement up and make sure that they are um, staying aware of what's happening and staying engaged. And that takes a lot of work. And uh, as the convener, which we ended up being, it is a little bit more work if you're the, if you're the one whose idea it was to convene everyone. of keeping everyone engaged kind of falls on you. But I think the benefit, um, the capacity to coordinate our efforts um, has been limited. We were really actually fortunate to have timed uh, obtaining a marketing intern around this time. So we have um, tasked our marketing intern, Maddie, with a ton of uh, this convening work and putting together um, social media posts that people can share and reminder emails and um, really supporting all the partners and getting their content out there. So that's been um, a huge, a huge benefit. And from an intern standpoint, I think it'll be a really cool feather in her cap to have organized the marketing campaign around this whole effort. So we're um, excited for her and that's been um, made it easier, but there are also still some challenges there. Um, I think having eight partners uh, makes all of the aspects of our planning
decision making takes longer. Um, and, uh, you know, we originally had hoped to get all of the marketing materials out for this um, in October, exactly, you know, one year before the one year anniversary and that we weren't able to get them out until January, just through the delays of, of trying to coordinate so many folks. Um, there's been some competition for um, resources and audience. We all are fundraising nonprofits in a small community, so um, that can sometimes be a challenge, although a small one. I think another challenge we weren't expecting is that some of our partners are really focused on advocacy, and some of our partners are land managers who really aren't able to um, to take a lobbyist or advocacy role. And so balancing how we're presenting and marketing our programs and making it clear who's presenting what. And that um, our land managers are, taking, you know, that our, our nonprofits are um, influencing the land management decisions in any way. So we've just been trying to be careful about that, but overall it's been um, more or less a fairly small issue. So um, what we've developed um, to get the word out about what we're doing, um, we worked uh, using Squarespace to create a website. Um, all of the partners are editors of this website so that we can add our programs, upload information. And you know, the cool thing about this platform, this Squarespace platform, is that the whole thing for the entire year costs us about $120. And this will be up through December. It's got all of the information, all of the events, all the information about the brewery. Posters that you can download, videos that you can watch uh, for all, all of the partners and the work we're doing around the Wild and Scenic Rivers 50th. And then of course it links out to all of our individual websites. So this felt like a good centralized way to get the word out. Um, some of the programs that we're doing, this is just a small sampling, um, lectures, films, family events, photo contests, fundraisers, um, stewardship events. So we've got um, quite a robust list. And if you're interested in, in seeing programs as they come out, they're all there on that website, centraloregonwildandscenic.org. Um, we created uh, shareable marketing materials, so poster, postcard, and a restaurant table tent. Uh, these are evergreen, so they'll be up around town all year and just direct all of the traffic back to the website. These are, um, I'm noticing now, these aren't the most updated versions. On there, but you get the idea that we've created here. Um, and then uh, if anybody's interested in how we're working with our partners at breweries, really we're what we're calling this is a beer naming campaign with the idea that if breweries name beers after these rivers and after um, characteristics of these rivers or um, anything of that nature, and if they reference the 50 year anniversary on the label, the people who drink that beer, and a lot of people in Bend drink beer, um, their awareness is raised, and the breweries really appreciate the opportunity to participate, um, particularly around water issues, um, because you need water to brew beer. So um, it was a really good fit, and, and I think part of the success of it is that we weren't asking them for fundraising dollars. We weren't asking them um, to fit into a calendar that we Really as flexible as possible for them to participate to get so many breweries to sign up is because we've got eight partners and we all sort of chipped in our contacts and and reached out to the folks that we knew and as i mentioned before we're closing in on 10 breweries and we'll feature each of those beers um, on the website as they come out the other cool thing about the brewery piece is that a lot of the breweries are opting to host events at their breweries when the beers come out so that's another set of events that um we don't have to plan, but that lend to the overall success of the year-long celebration. So um, it was a win-win for all of us there. Um, so that's essentially what we're doing here in Central Oregon. You can learn more about it um, at centraloregonwildandscenic.org. And um, any specific questions folks have or individual questions, I'm happy to respond to those via email. And um, thanks for listening.
Awesome. Thank you so much. So this is Lisa. Um, can, can folks hear me? We are having a little audio trouble, it sounds like. Yeah, you're fine. Great. Um, so thank you so much, Rika, for sharing um, the great work that's being done in Central Oregon. And now um, we'll hear from another area of the country. So introducing our next speaker, her name is Deb Run, and she's been the executive director of the St. Croix River Association since October 2009. She has 21 years of experience with management and coordination of multiple stakeholder initiatives, watershed level planning, and implementation of on-the-ground projects to protect land and water. She has helped guide the organization into becoming the official partner group for the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway. So Deb, um, we'd love to hear your stories of success um, for the 50th. Great, thank you for having me today. Can everyone see and hear? I'm assuming yes. Uh, okay, I'm gonna launch in. I cannot hear anyone, so um, I'm assuming you can hear me. You're you're really fuzzy. Um, do you can you close any other programs you might have open am, right now? I have no other programs running. Okay, that sounds clearer now. Thanks. Okay, so I'll just make sure that I'm pointed your way. Um, well, thank you for having me today. I, I am going to just talk about really our celebrations. We could repeat a lot of what Rika has said. We started planning in 2016. We're doing this through collaborations. We have a very thoughtful effort. Um, but I'm going to start with just a little bit of background about the St. Croix River Association and our Riverway. Um, starting maybe with um, uh, I seem not to be going slide down. There we go. Um, the riverway is about 255 miles. It is only one riverway, but this was one of the original wild and scenic rivers. Um, created in 1968 along with original uh, legislation. We were the only river named a national park in that year. The organization itself works throughout the watershed. You can see on the right hand side, we've got an almost 8,000 square mile watershed. The organization itself was founded in 1911. We were all volunteer and two. Until 2009, um, we have a mission to protect, restore, and celebrate. And in 2011, we became the Friends Group for the Riverway. One of the first things we uh, did when we uh, started looking at marketing material, you'll notice up in the upper right-hand corner, our logo. So we took the Wild and Scenic logo, uh, we collectively, the par partners, um, created the logo using your shield within a larger. Um, and because the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway is two rivers, we wanted to make sure both the St. Croix and the Namakagan were, were highlighted in everything that we do. Um, for us, we're, we have three major goals. One is honoring the past. So in 1965, Can I go? Um, so in 1965, Gail Nelson and Walter Mondell um, introduced the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. First, um, it didn't go anywhere until 1968. And, it, and the reason for our end of things that it worked so very well was we had a public-private corporate partnership that was really absolutely critical um, to making things happen on our end. So we had Northern States Powers who was looking to um, do something with 25,000 acres that um, ran along the riverway. We had uh, Gaylord Nelson who was really very passionate and interested about protecting the riverway and of course Walter Miles. Hey, Nelson. Uh, Deb? Hey, yeah. Deb, I think we're, we're gonna pause a second, have you actually call in um, it's, I think it's pretty hard for people to hear right now. Ryan's going to send you the number to call in. Do you want to try that? 
Uh, okay, so you're not hearing me at all? It's just been rather garbled. Um, uh, you may okay. Go, go into your audio panel and switch over to the phone call mode. Hopefully Deb will be with us in just a moment here on the phone. Deb, can you hear me now? Yep. All right, so uh, go back to big screen and pick up where I left off. Perfect, thank you. Thanks for everyone's patience, that's great. We appreciate it. Uh, no worries. Can you see the screen now okay? Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, uh, I was talking about <laughs> honoring the past. I think I'll just move on from there. Um, so the, our first goal was to honor the past. Our second goal was to celebrate the National Park as it is now. Um, and then our third goal was to secure the future. Those are our three goals that basically um, are at the forefront of our mind for everything that we do. Um, and I will tell you, it's really easy to get sidetracked and to try to go off into all sorts of different directions, but we've been really... Um, purposeful about continuing to, to circle back to sticking to our goals on all our activities and our key messages that we've developed to help guide us throughout all the programs. So we have a series of programs much like Rika talked about in that we have some inside, some outside programs that we're doing and I'm going to just kind of run through some of the, the biggest things. Um, Uh, and the first thing that we started off with this this year was our speaker series. So in the past, we've always done speaker series with the National Park Service, and that's just an, a set of um, speakers we have in to talk about anything to do with nature and the National Park. Um, and this year, we decided to, co to brand those with the 50th event, again, trying to get that look and... Um, understanding out to the general public through some things that we were already planning to do. So we're not doing extra work. Uh, we kicked it off with a really wonderful exploration um, talk by Dave Freeman, who, who um, spent a year with his wife in the Boundary Waters. And then we did Sex, Bugs, and Rock and Roll, which we just finished this last week. It was really a birthday party for the park. Both give us a lot of opportunity to, to, to get out there with press releases. Um, and then probably more important, we've done the press releases and we've done um, some posting on Facebook and all that that everybody does for every event. But we really started looking at what audiences would we normally not hit. So, for instance, on the Exploring the World's Rivers, we we went to Northland College and we went to some of the outfitters that are in the area, and we went to the Hook and Bullet Clubs, and we just went to some non-traditional people that were trying to reach and said, hey, we're going to do this event. Could you post and could you um, try to get people to come? We're doing that very purposeful outreach to all of our, for all of our events that we do. And the, the key thing we're trying to do there is really to broaden our audience. Another thing that we're doing is um, we're doing a photo book. This is a picture of Craig Blacklock. He is in the Midwest, thought of the Ansel Adams of the Midwest. He approached us about doing 
a book about the Riverway almost two years ago now. Um, we spent the last year helping him to find special places to go. Um, and and now the book is at print, and pretty soon we will be having our first uh, um, gallery opening. So he will be going to at least six different galleries, taking photos of the Riverway out. We'll be doing grand openings along with um, uh, celebra birthday celebrations, talking about the Riverway, its 50 years, um, wild and scenic and all of that. And we do get a piece of the proceeds off of his book. Uh, we're also doing a feature film. Um, this is a 27-minute film. We just had a pre preview of last night, and it's turning out beautifully. This is a picture of Walter Mondale and his children. Um, I'm sorry, Gaylord, Gaylord Nelson and his children. And um, so the film, again, will have that same string, string of honor the past, celebrate what we have, and securing the future. All three things will be defined in the in the film. We're doing a premiere of the film on June 6th, where we'll have a pan panel um, who will talk to Wild and Scenic Rivers and how, again, we're going to bring more diverse audiences, how we're going to protect uh, the riverway into the future, and really look at what does into perpetuity mean. As we all know right now, with the current political climate, laws only are as good as long as they remain intact. So um, that's something we're going to explore a little bit, both through this film and through the premieres that we do throughout the state. We're going to do a lot of out outdoor adventures um, and outings. Again, we're branding those wild and scenic uh, events this year and, and activities. In the winter, we're doing lots of snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, hiking, candlelight events, those sorts of things. In the summer, we'll paddle um, the St. Croix and Namakagan rivers. We're doing our week-long um, paddles in Namakagan again this year, and again, we're, we're branding it with the 50th anniversary. With our paddles, we bring community along, so our, our, our on-river activities are never just about being on the water. They're also about bringing community in. So we'll, for instance, paddle into a small town of Hayward into one of these, and we'll have um, events in the communities using local vendors to, to bring the business community along the celebration with us. Again, everything we do is branded with the 50th. Um, we, have a, we have developed um, handouts and different things that we will give to people at the end of every event. So we always tend to overthink and try to give too much information when we do these sorts of things, um, but we tried to boil it down to the essence, give people something to do, drive them to the website, and have them um, look at some other things. Um, one of the big things I, I cannot reiterate enough is consistent wording. So we've come up with some key things that we say on virtually everything that we do. And just coming up with the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway turns 50 in 2018, that's something to celebrate. And coming up with really those sorts of lines that you can use over and over again really is helpful as you move forward. And then, oops, I wanted to point out the red piece. Um, probably one of the biggest things that we have to do if we're going to continue um, into the next 50 years and beyond is to get people to commit to doing something so that start now, get involved. Action words are really um, a big part of what we're doing at every one of our events. And then we move on to the partners piece, which Anastasia will pick up. Um, she's one of our wonderful partners who's hosting 50 event, 50th events. We've put our logo out there to, for pretty much everybody to, to use. The only thing we've asked is that they've not used it to sell or to profit off of. I don't care if they use it to, for event, events and all sorts of other things, but um, don't use it as a sales tool for yourself or for a for-profit entity. 
other than that, all the other entities, all the other organizations are welcome to pick up our logo and brand any of the events that they do. We have about 50 different partners who've committed to doing something this year. So we we know that we will have minimally 50 events. Right now, I think we're closing in on about 100 events throughout the year. Um, and um, this is a screenshot of St. Croix Splash, which is a local arts community who has a, a calendar that basically talks about everything going out throughout the valley. So we're very lucky to have um, close partners with us working on everything that we do. And with that, I think that I'm going to turn it over to Anastasia to talk about our partnership um, and how we get going. Thanks so much, Deb. This is uh, Lisa again, just wanting to in introduce our next speaker, uh, Anastasia. And, and thank you, Deb, for the segue to Anastasia's part of this and for um, explaining a little bit about the unique relationship that the FIP Center for the Arts shares with um, the St. Croix River Association and some lessons learned there that um, other folks can take away for um, not only a great partnership, but also how to engage the arts uh, as, a, as a portion of the 50th anniversary. So with that, um, let me introduce Anastasia Sharton, who has been the Visual Arts Director for the Phipps Center for the Arts in Hudson, Wisconsin since 2000. Anastasia's career highlights include many successful art exhibits, uh, as well as her collaboration with the Hudson Hospital to establish the Healing Arts Program throughout the St. Croix River Valley, collectively called the Bench Project. She was also a recipient of the St. Croix Watershed Stewardship Award uh, from the St. Croix River Association in 2012 for her work on art projects promoting actions for a healthy river. So thank you, Anastasia, so much for joining us. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Thank you for having yeah. me. I just want to be certain that my screen is showing up correctly. Yeah, we can see it. Thanks. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So, um, yes, I am from the Phipps Center for the Arts. Um, we're a um, community arts center, uh, multidisciplinary. So we have uh, theater and dance and music um, as well as the visual arts. And uh, we are located um, just right across... Whoops, my computer's not advancing here. There we go. Um, we're actually located right across um, from the St. Croix River um, in Hudson here. And these are images of uh, a couple of different programs that we've done over the years, bringing people out um, to Lakefront Park or um, paddling um, across the river to, to the islands that are right um, out in front of us too. So um, really um, taking advantage of being right here on the St. Croix River and integra integrating experiences on the river and responses to those experiences through our programs is something that, uh, um, that we've done over the years. Um, and so um, working on a project like this just was, um, was really an obvious no-brainer for us to be involved. Back in 2016, um, we par partnered with the National Park Service to celebrate the centennial of a national park system um, with an, a, a national juried exhibition titled National Parks Personal Narratives. Um, and uh, uh, very much the experience that we had um, organizing that show and the related programs uh, and activities that we had is something that, um, that we're uh, referencing or, or um, that experiencing experience we're using as we're um, planning for this year's events. These are a couple of images from the juried exhibition. So this shows our galleries. Um, and again, we had artists from throughout the country, even some artists from abroad um, who were accepted into this juried exhibition. Uh, we did some pre-events uh, um, for that exhibition where we got a group of artists here on the left. This is a group of artists who participate in an ongoing series um, called What We Need Is Here, exploring the role of art and sustainability. Got them out on the National Park Service pontoon um, to uh, be out on the river, and that then inspired them to make work that then they submitted um, to the exhibition 
on the right hand side is uh, some plein air painters that um, had a similar experience with the National Park Service and then that inspired them to do this ongoing um, project of, of painting along the river and those paintings were included in a special um, section of the exhibit that we had. So this year um, we're planning uh, an exhibition called Heart of the River celebrating the first 50 years of the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway and um, this is a multi-part exhibition. There is um, the juried um, ex uh, exhibit that is part of that and for that we are putting a call out or actually have a call out currently um, that we've been promoting since uh, the summer of last year um, and the call is inviting artists nationwide um, to submit work for this exhibition that expresses the significance of the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway in their lives and communicates that connect connection through unique depictions, interpretations, impressions, memories, and hopes for the future. So that's, uh, you know, this is an image from the previous um, show that we did for the National Park Service, but again, we will restage or put a new juried exhibition together uh, inspired by this, this year's uh, 50th anniversary celebration. And then um, we will be one of the um, places that will exhibit Craig Blacklock's photographs that Deb uh, mentioned, the project that he did about the St. Croix River. So um, at the same time as the national juried um, exhibit is going on in, um, in uh, several of our galleries, one of the other galleries will be dedicated to Craig's work. And then um, we will be debuting a, um, a video game uh, created by Dave Beck called Tom Bow. Um, Dave is uh, from uh, Menominee, teaches at UW Stout, and uh, this Tom Bow is a first-person exploration game set in a historically accurate 3D environment taking place on a small section of the St. Croix River. And through um, interaction um, with this, game. Um, the uh, gamers, players, will learn about um, the history of the St. Croix um, River and um, discover various things through unique objects, environments, and narratives, all of which reflect the history and also allude to the future. Um, we also have an ongoing series of exhibitions that we've been presenting in partnership with the Northern Clay Center called Earth and Water, Ceramic Art in the St. Croix River Valley. And for uh, this exhibition uh, in the fall, we will have uh, invite the artists who have participated in that over the past three to four years for kind of an alumni um, group exhibition. So this will be a really great opportunity for us to get some of the um, best ceramic artists working here in the St. Croix Valley together and to show their work together. The St. Croix is an incredibly um, rich region for ceramic artists. So to kind of seed the exhibition and get people excited um, about what's, what's, uh, what we have coming up and, um, and to also encourage um, participation um, in the juried show um, and otherwise, we have some pre-programming. So um, we've got a photography workshop um, that we're organizing for adults that John Greger is going to be leading, um, Landscape Light, Capturing the Heart of the River. And this is uh, in April there, so that um, in time for the July 1 submission deadline for the juried exhibition, ideally the photographers who participate in this workshop will be inspired to create work um, that could be a part of the show. Um, we run a really popular summer art camp program here um, for students ages four up through teens. And we have over the years had um, art and nature classes. Um, it's a series called Just Add Water. And so this year we're branding <laughs> several of those classes in addition to a special class that the St. Croix River Association is going to be teaching here, um, branding that as uh, classes that are related to the 50th anniversary celebration. and some of the projects then that are created through these classes will be shown uh, more than likely during the opening reception for um, the exhibition and or at other events. So um, we're seeing this as a great way to uh, have uh, kind of get out um, the message of this 50th anniversary. You know, we have uh, mailing out to about 4,000 different families and then, you know, all of the various other outreach and publicity we do for the summer art camp. Um, in addition to then having those um, those really great experiences and really direct experiences with the river and um, and creating art inspired by those experiences and a way to get kids involved and families involved as well. So we're um, excited about that. That's coming up um, soon. Our publicity will start rolling here in the next couple weeks for that. 
Um, and then I mentioned the What We Need Is Here artists. That's an ongoing um, group um, of artists who meet about monthly. And we will focus one of our seminar workshops this spring on the 50th anniversary. Um, and again, get that, uh, that group of, of regional local artists um, really deeply engaged and involved in the activities here. Um, at our opening event, um, the opening event that we did for the, fifth, the 100th anniversary um, of the um, National Park Service was um, really hugely attended and, um, and a really exciting, dynamic um, event with a lot going on. And so we hope to somehow recreate um, that uh, for the opening reception for the Heart of the River. Um, we will have the earth and water artists, the ceramic artists here, and um, they'll um, give a gallery talk um, about their work. Um, we will have the film screening um, showing periodically through the um, two hours of the exhibition, and the director of that film will be speaking. This is the film that Deb um, spoke about earlier that uh, they just previewed last night. Um, we'll also have a local bluegrass band um, playing here, so we'll have some live music to really liven things up. And then we have um, these art and nature, pop-up art and nature activities. And we have a group of youth volunteers who have been trained um, to engage people and facilitate those activities. So we'll have that going on as well. So some real kind of hands-on interactive um, things going on. And then, as I mentioned, summer art camp, um, the, uh, perhaps a performance or a song. Um, the, one of the classes is creating a movie. And then um, we will also have the art to display. So that will be a draw for those families to, to come specifically for that. Um, and then the Na National Park Service will be here. Again, the um, St. Croix River is a national park. And so we'll really highlight that again um, with a display and handouts and um, ideally some park rangers here um, wearing their regalia as well. During the run um, of the exhibit, we have a few related events planned. Um, Craig Blacklock is going to be giving a photo talk, and that's something that the Western Wisconsin Photography Club is really excited about, and they are organizing and co-sponsoring um, that talk. So we anticipate getting really great turnout for that. Um, a lot of people are, are already really excited um, to be able to meet him and, and to hear um, about his work. Um, we are also going to be training docents, so community volunteers um, that will join us to learn more about the exhibition um, and uh, work with the St. Croix River Association and our other partners to be able to um, lead tours of the exhibition uh, to the public. Uh, we also host an art festival um, right across the street in Lakefront Park. Um, this is an event that brings about 8,000 people um, over, over the two days. and. Uh, so we will have the docents then be able to meet um, people at uh, the art festival and at scheduled times um, bring them across the street um, to give them tours of the exhibition. So um, we're trying in, in many ways to integrate this exhibition into um, the activities that we already have going on here at the FIPS and in, in Hudson um, and bring the arts into this um, celebration um, really as much as possible. Um, we also have, um, in the very initial planning stages, um, a community forum on stewardship um, that the local faith community has expressed real interest in, in hosting and, and helping to organize. So we have just begun conversations with our, our local partners on that. Um, there's also a poetry reading event. Um, there are local poets who um, are becoming more and more active and uh, looking for venues um, to read their poetry. And so this will be one of uh, three events throughout this year. Um, and again, we will be highlighting um, this as something celebrating the 50th um, anniversary. So that's so far what we have planned. Um, and, uh, and as you can see, there's still a lot of work to be done and work in progress, but um, uh, it is something that we are really looking forward to and looking forward to continuing our work with the St. Croix River Association. Thank you so much, Anastasia, and um, all. Uh, thank you, a big thank you to all of our presenters. I hope um, that those of you participating today have learned a little bit about uh, what's possible, as well as some lessons learned related to partnership, partnership development, um, community building, those sorts of, of um, concepts that we're all working with to work with our partners and integrate the anniversary into existing programming, as well as to create new and different events that would be unique and um, reflective of the anniversary. So I just want to have a, a few closing remarks before we go to questions. Um, again, just a reminder to mark your calendars for our two upcoming webinars. 
Um, so webinar number two, late March, early April, um, with some plug and play uh, options and more story sharing. Um, webinar number three, June 4th, uh, looking at engaging with outfitters, students, and diverse populations. Um, I would encourage any of those um, people who are participating, if you have unique stories that you'd like to share, um, please contact me. And with that, I'll just leave this information up uh, for the remainder of the webinar. I'm the moderator, Lisa Ronald. Uh, my contact information is, that, is at the top. And if you do have uh, questions for any of our presenters, um, you can um, email them, contact them uh, using the information provided, and I would encourage you to do so if you have questions or if you've heard something today that you think would be perfect for, um, for your location or an idea that you'd want to, to bounce off of our presenters. I think they would be more than happy to share um, their expertise with you today. So um, with that, I think we want to go ahead and open up for questions. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks so much. Those were great presentations. and. Um... Glad we got the audio figured out. Um, I am checking the question box, and um, I don't have any new questions right now. So, if there's any ones that you all want to type in, otherwise, uh, Lisa and I can ask a few of the panelists. So, anyways, any questions at all? Okay, it says um, one question coming in, and this for you, Lisa, is could you share the toolkit again? Do you think you want to share your screen and show sort of what's in there a little bit? You bet. Yes, I would be happy to do that. And hopefully, um, you know, as folks are, are, are kind of listening to me, you can type in additional questions for our presenters. So I'll give a brief overview of our toolkit here. Um, the, the web address for that is rivers.gov. Um, and then, as you'll see, there's a 50 years little button here um, on the top of rivers.gov, and you'll see our toolkit, our event map, and then anniversary videos. So just to give you a brief tour of um, kind of what's in the toolkit here, we have a section that asks you a little bit about what you want to do. Do you want to host an event, host a new event? There are a variety of um, different sorts of resources under here. You know, obviously, we heard a little bit today about the integration of art and music and, um, you know, those elements into the anniversary, but there are a lot of other aspects. There are film festivals, there are exhibits in public places such as museums and airports, um, there are lectures and speakers, presenters, um, you know, stewardship activities such as river cleanups, et cetera. So, a lot of different ideas here, and um, we've gleaned resources not only from things that we've collected, but also from information that's been submitted from the field. So this is a growing and um, kind of changing resource based on the information that we get. Um, we have information on our 50th anniversary logo products. These are great for, um, you know, f for events or for outreach. Um, we've negotiated a variety of um, uh, relationships with different um, producers of merchandise to um, offer these specific uh, logo-themed products uh, at wholesale rates, um, and portions of the proceeds go to support um, the national anniversary team. So there are a bunch of different resources, a um, bunch of different products here, everything from you know, safety whistles, which are kind of more of a safety product, to um, you know, things like your koozies and your temporary tattoos, stickers, et cetera. Um, the next section on sharing your story. Um, so, you know, as a couple of our presenters, I think, alluded to, there's there's often um, some um, interesting relationships and some interesting conversations that take place when you combine organizations with an advocacy focus um, with those with stewardship. And so one of the great partnerships, I think, that has evolved through the Rivers 50th with our advocacy partners, American Rivers and American Whitewater, is to um, encourage folks like yourself to participate in their 5,000 Miles of Wild campaign. Um, this campaign certainly has a designation focus to it, but it also has a, a media campaign collecting 5,000 stories 
of ways that rivers um, have touched uh, individual people's lives. So basically an opportunity for you as a practitioner, as a manager, as you know, someone working for an advocacy or stewardship organization, even as a volunteer or just uh, you know someone who, who simply loves rec river recreation, um, there's a place for your story uh, in this 5,000 miles um, storytelling campaign. So definitely a way to participate there. And then finally, I'll just point out some of the resources in the references material um, section. We have some great briefing papers, uh, little fact sheets on water quality, um, recreation, geology, et cetera, some of the outstanding um, values of rivers. Those are being translated into Spanish, so we have them um, duly available in, in multiple languages. Um, we have a lot of information um, for agency folks as well as some marketing information that talks about our taglines and other social media related uh, information. Um, and then we have a listing obviously of webinars, videos, uh, et cetera. So a lot of stuff in the, in the, in the toolkit um, here to share. So um, I hope folks have, have had enough time to maybe type in a couple of questions for our presenters. Um, Catherine, do, are we seeing anything come in? Um, just a clarifying question. One thing is um, someone asked about the presentation being recorded and we are, this is being recorded and we'll send the, the link out as on the email link when we do the follow up. So that will be available for folks. Um, I don't know another question, but here's one. So I think the, um, the integration of art and rivers and water is a really important one. It's exciting to hear about. What advice do you all have for people who maybe are not working with artists right now? How do you approach that? Um, that connection in that community. So this is Deb. Um, I, I think I'll start the answer with that. There are um, artists that come out to the river all the time. So if you're out and about, you see somebody out painting, the best, the first and best thing you can do is just approach the artist and, and just start a conversation and open a dialogue and they're almost always very approachable and want to chat with you and very willing to work with you. Um, that's how we started with several of our local artists. And then the other next and most important thing is to go to places like art. We have art reach or art galleries or um, like the FIP Center to the Art and just start a conversation and see where your missions overlap. And, and it's amazing how water is really very moving. Water and rivers in particular is um, really very moving and touches people at their hearts and souls. And so it's a natural tie to the arts and music com uh, communities. And I really encourage um, that connection in all of your programs, not just for the celebrations. That's great, that's great advice. Yeah, I think people, I know a lot of people are thinking about how to make that happen um, more, you know, comprehensively. So it's really exciting to hear about. Um, Lisa, do you have a question for the panelists? Um, you know, I, not yet. I wanted to um, just share one resource um, that, that I think would help address that question from our toolkit. So um, in our toolkit, um, in the arts and music section, we have some information and, and one of the resources that has just come um, about literally in the last week is um, this landscape um, music uh, um, kind of paper. So um, there's a network, um, I think, of, of um, composers that are really interested in um, kind of working with different organizations. And so they put out kind of a, a, a proposal call. So that might be something that, you know, folks who don't have established relationships um, might want to check out to see if that's, um, that's a good fit. There are also some other suggestions in this section about working with um, artist residencies or creating artist residencies. Um, and then um, a great guy, Stephen Wood, who um, is a composer himself and, and an art residency, con residency consultant, um, you know, has offered his expertise in, in helping folks out who are interested in, you know, creating those those sorts of things. So um, I think, you know, kind of stepping off of, you know, what Deb said about just kind of approaching those in your local community, um, and then obviously checking to see whether some of these resources that that might create something more formal would be um, would be of interest. 
That's great. Okay, good. This is Catherine Barrett, River Network, and clearly a lot of good resources in this toolkit that the Wild and Scenic team has put together. All right, we just got a great question in. Um, Christy, we are a watershed association in region. We do not yet have a Wild and Scenic designation, but we're interested in becoming designated. One, are there resources to help guide us in this process? And two, how can we incorporate celebration of wild and scenic rivers into our events, given we're in that sort of reason? So, I don't know, Lisa, or if anyone wants to take that, I've got some thoughts on that, but we'll hand it over to you all first. I'm sorry, can you, re can you read that? That was a very complicated question. Can you yeah, read that okay. one more so time? This is, yeah, this is someone who's in a, is a watershed association in a region uh, where they do not yet have wild and scenic uh, river designations, but they're interested in getting some. So one, are there resources to help guide this group um, in the designation process? And two, even without rivers, are there ways that they can incorporate the celebration of wild and scenic rivers into their events? Um, so this is Lisa, and I'll um, chime in here, and, and any of our um, folks uh, can, can obviously add into this. Um, so the answer to your question is um, yes and yes. So um, one of the contacts that, that I would suggest that you make is with um, American Rivers. Uh, they have, um, they're an, a national uh, organization with um, representatives across the country. And um, they are very interested as part of the 5,000 miles of wild campaign that I mentioned in working with local stakeholders to protect um, rivers that are not currently designated. Um, the, the designation landscape, I think, is broader than um, the wild and scenic designated status, and there are a lot of um, different, I think, protection options, similar to the suite of public land options that we have with parks, national monuments, national forests, wilderness, et cetera. I think within the scope of rivers, there are also other options in um, working for protection. So I think gaining some consultation specifically from them as to um, you know, what sort of protection mechanisms might be most effective in your area and you know whether those are um, wild and scenic designations specifically or whether they are say administrative protection through forest or land management planning processes um, all of those have merit i think in um, protecting your local river which i think is the at the end of the day um, you know it, it sounds like it is is the desired outcome there so um, i think that's the you know the answer um, you know to the the first question um, and then I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of forgetting this, the second question now that I've been talking. Can you just give me a couple keywords, Catherine, to remind me? Yeah, this is Debbie. Yeah. Um, I just, I'd like to just okay. jump in and just say, if, if you are not designated wild and scenic now, and you are interested in using um, the 50th as, as something you'd like to do, I think if you see yourself there and you start positioning yourself there, you'll get the community used to thinking like that, and that will help you as you go to get designated, whether it's a state designation, a local designation, or a national designation. Yeah, good point. So it's sort of part of this community engagement yep. process. So that's what the second part yeah. was, sort of how do you engage people, even you know, use this celebration event as a leverage point to, to make get people interested. Absolutely. And I think um, one final piece there is, you know, that we are, while this is certainly the celebration, um, you know, of wild and scenically designated rivers, um, I think we all can identify with the statement that we all are downstream of a wild and scenic river, whether or not we live near or on one at present. So I think the messaging that we've developed, um, it's your river, make your splash, is completely applicable to uh, non-designated rivers, and we've intended it that way specifically. So I think we're very excited, and, and I'm, I'm happy to have that question asked, because I think that's really important to uh, illustrate that this is not just the anniversary of um, just wild and scenic rivers, it's the anniversary of our relationship with rivers and, and with water, and um, Certainly, that's much more much more expansive than um, simply the wild and scenic river designation. Yeah, and I think um, this is Catherine Barrett River Network again. That also at the meeting I mentioned at the beginning at River Rally, we're having in April is open, you know, to all any and all community and nonprofit groups who are interested 
in talking about the future of Wild and Scenic Rivers, including how you get more designations. So we'll be there with our partners. It'll be River Network and American Rivers and American Whitewater and some of our federal partners um, talking about what, you know, what the future sort of holds and ways we might work together across the country better. We're as part of that lead up to that, um, River Network's working on an assessment sort of of groups to find out what the needs are going forward. If it is sort of, you know, help on the designation side or the management side or something about in getting involved with the arts, you know, whatever it is. So we're definitely interested in talking to you and my name's not up there, but I'm Kay Bear at rivernetwork.org. So we'd love to hear from any of you who are thinking about, you know, what you're looking at as needs working on wild and scenic rivers as you move forward this year and in future years. So we got another question. Let's take this one from Laura. Um, we have a wild and scenic festival at the end of September in Kentucky. Um, we're interested in having musical music at the festival, but having a hard time finding music. Um, are there any ideas on music, I guess, funding and finding, finding and funding music for an outdoor education adventure event? Well, so this is Lisa. We do have um, a very a, a kind of a small listing of some music and songs that I think are, are river specific. Um, I think when when looking for a local band that that, you know, that might be a little bit difficult. And, um, you know, I, I, honestly, I think I would love to hear Anastasia from you if you have any um, suggestions. I know you mentioned in one of your events there'll be live music and just in any of your experiences with the arts, if, if there are um, suggestions you could offer. Yeah, I'm racking my brains here. <laughs> this, um, so the, um, the Bluegrass Band is actually a band that uh, um, kind of came to us. Um, there was an artist who we were showing in the galleries and at the opening reception for his show, um, he, you know, invited a bunch of his friends who play music and they, they came and, and performed and, you know, just spontaneously in a way. And, um, and we just, they are amazing. So we, um, we jumped on them to, to come to our, our opening, um, reception. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm so focused in the visual arts end of things that I, I'm not, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how, how much, uh, helpful I can be about that. I mean, I, I don't know the community, but there, I've got to believe that there's some local venues, even, you know, bars or, or places where there are musicians playing or a music store or, you know, sort of somehow, um, you know, trying to tap in. I think that once you once you find that vein, it, I'm sure it will run <laughs> um, rich and and um, and full. But it's you know just sort of for your unique um, you know community or or your region, maybe thinking a little bit more broadly. What's kind of the biggest town nearby, and and you know tapping in um, to uh, you know to some of the resources there, and then kind of finding um, you know uh, possibilities that way. So I hope that's helpful. Sorry. Yeah, no, and we got a suggestion written in um, from Carl about one suggestion is to check with local folk and bluegrass associations that are apparently are in a lot of states. So they might have some help getting out the people place, that way. The other place that we've had some success is with the local radio stations. So we have a couple of smaller radio stations that have people in all the time. And they're really good resources for us to bring in. Um, some of the smaller bands are a little less expensive to come into our festivals. Yeah, that's a good idea. Or universities, um, you know, even high schools, um, you know, uh, if that's, you know, music departments and, and such too, so. And you know, I think that presents a great opportunity to um, maybe develop a relationship around water music with, um, you know, a, a band that you like that may or may not have that as part of their repertoire, but um, might be very open, particularly if there's time. You know, I think um, this this particular festival is in September. You know, I think there's there's quite a bit of time between now and then. Um, to, to explore a relationship like that in which you might commission or 
um, otherwise challenge uh, an organization or a, a, a you know a musical group to come up with new material that that would be illustrative and that would be you know river related specifically for that event. Great. Okay. So that's all the questions we have coming into the chat box. Um, Lisa, so do you have others or are you ready to, to wrap? You know, I don't have other questions. So um, I think if, um, yeah, if you want to go ahead and go and uh, move to the survey, I think we're wrapping up for today. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so I just want to, this is Catherine Barrett River Network, and just really want to give a shout out to our presenters um, from Oregon and all over the all over the country. It's really a great mix of um, places to be able to, to share with you today, and a big thanks to Lisa for organizing it and moderating today, and we look forward to working with all of you, and um, we hope you will join us on the additional webinars that are coming up. And we'll get more information about those as they get confirmed and um, hopefully join us at River Valley as well. So thank you very much. Um, please take the survey when it comes your way and we appreciate it. So thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day.